Okay, welcome to our uh, final lecture for the year in uh, CH8343. What we're going to do today is take some, take a look at some electrochemical instrumentation and it'll give you a very brief idea of what's going on when you use your potential set or something related to it. So I'll go over a little bit of the basics of electronics, just enough so we can understand what's going on in the potential set. And then we, uh, once we finish with that, we'll return, I think, if we have time to the uh, industrial electrochemistry section in the notes that I handed out last time. So we'll see how far we get today and, and if we don't finish all the stuff on the notes, well that's, that's too bad, we're not going to finish. For the students in the class, I uh, have your, I didn't get to grade your last homework session, uh, set that you handed it back, it was a long time ago, but uh, sometime this week I'll have it done and you can come by and pick it up. Perhaps when you uh, drop off your report, which remember is due on Friday, so, all right. No, it was actually due last Friday, but the last possible day they turn it in is Friday, this Friday. Okay, so what we'll talk about today is electrochemical instrumentation. And we, this follows roughly the outline, it's in the, it's the, of the chapter in the book, which is chapter 13. And we don't have time to cover all the topics in the book, and some of the stuff I'm talking about will be perhaps more completely explained in the book if you're having a little bit of trouble. And some of the stuff I'll have in here is not in the chapter from other sources. And if we will not be able to get into really detailed instrumentation ideas at this point. But let's take a look at what we need to know about in order to do instrumentation. Since electrochemistry deals with electricity, we have to ask ourselves how can we develop instrumentation to control the potential at our working electrode? And that's an important aspect. How can we control the current at a working electrode? And so usually these two types of instruments that do that are called a potentiostat for controlled potential, galvanostat for controlled currents. It's got the word stat in there, which is the same root as things like stasis and static, which means constant. And so it's holding the potential constant or the, in the case of galvanostat, the holding the current constant referring to the idea of galvanic and galvani, which is a current. Also, we want to be able to measure the current that we develop by controlling the potential, and that would be done with an ammeter of some sort. Or we might want to measure the voltage that develops across our cell. And we can use a voltmeter, but usually what we want to use is a more sophisticated device called an electrometer, which has better properties for measuring a voltage. We also often want to measure charge, which we can do directly with a Coulomb meter, or perhaps we can do that now with a digital program or a program on the computer that'll automatically integrate the current and give us a charge measurement. Uh, in either case, you can either develop a Coulomb meter directly or do the later analysis. One nice thing about computers is that many types of experimental methods that required uh, specific types of uh, current or voltage control can be relaxed a little bit because the theory and the computing power is increased to the point where you can do less complicated experiments but get more complicated analysis of those experiments. So I think the ultimate direction will be simpler experimental methods and more complicated experimental uh, analysis because we've got so much simple and cheap computing power to be able to do that. The other way that we're doing experiments is often what they call a frequency analysis, where you take the uh, cell and subject it to an analysis by looking at all the possible signals that you get out at all the possible frequencies. And you can't do all the possible signals, but you can look at a subset of signals at uh, various frequencies and get information about the, how the cell is wired up and make a model of the cell based on C components such as resistors and capacitors and inductors and, and so on, and then use that model as a basis for understanding what's going on in the cell. For example, you could put in a double air capacitance as a circuit element, but there's all kinds of elements in your circuit that you could add on, and by building a model and fitting your data from your actual experiment to the model, you can see, uh, see if things are what you expect. Frequency analysis is used a lot in things like corrosion research and uh, 
and so on, where you have, especially where you have things that are happening on a wide range of time scales. Corrosion is happening on a, a year time scale, but the individual events may be happening on a millisecond or microsecond time scale. So you need a wide range of, of uh, time scales to understand that process and using a simple method like cyclic voltammetry does not give you that sort of information. You need to look at all the frequencies to understand completely what's going on. Uh, of course, today we use computers a lot and they will have to require some sort of digital inputs and outputs. And they can either be direct digital inputs and outputs, in other words, you will have in your computer a device that will convert currents and voltages to digital signals that the computer can read directly, such as a, what they call an analog to digital converter card or a digital to analog converter card, and these two things would fit perhaps right in your computer. And then you'd have a computer program that either you'd write or the vendor would supply that would let you do that uh, graphing and analysis. Many instruments now also have a supplemental device to, so that they do all the digitizing internally to the device. In other words, you have a box and the box itself converts the digital, or the current and voltage to digital signals. And that box then sends those digital signals to the computer. So there's a, a, a step that you can skip. You don't have to have that card in your computer to do that. And uh, may, especially the fancier commercial instruments have this sort of capability. One advantage of that is it's often easier to control those boxes because you don't have to worry about the low level process of converting the signals to a digital values. And of course there's still good old analog inputs and outputs. You can record the output on a, a recorder, a pen recorder, or, a, or a, a, even like a, a tape recorder which records the signals. Or you could look at it on an oscilloscope screen. And of course, as computers become more and more predominant, analog outputs will be less and less used, although I don't think they'll ever completely be eliminated. Because the signals are always predominantly analog, so we're always gonna need some way to look at those analog signals. All right, well I have on here a bunch of symbols that you might come across, and they're just a small, small subset of all the possible symbols that you'll see when you look at electrical diagrams, but uh, I think it's probably easier for me to show it directly rather than writing them all down again. All right, well here we have some different symbols and you can look on your notes to follow along. Of course, the simplest symbol is wire, a wire that's not so trivial. Um, you have all kinds of wires, but then oftentimes we'll just draw a straight line to indicate that. Uh, connected wires are often indicated by a, a little dot there. You'll notice there's a little dot where the intersection occurs. What you'll notice also is that connected wires in most modern circuit diagrams, although not all of them, most modern circuit diagrams will not cross if they're connected. They'll go to that dot and stop, so they're T-type connections, they're not a cross-type connection. In contrast, you'll see unconnected dot wires will be shown as crossing because often it's not possible to draw a diagram without crossing some wires. And those, because there are no dot there in the center and they're a cross form, that indicates that they're not connected. And that's not always true, but in most modern diagrams and most uh, formats and most, uh, are, that's the recommended way. An old fashioned way might be to draw it like this where you draw a little semicircle there to indicate that there's a wire going over the top of the other wire. That's really unnecessary. You have all the information you need here so you don't really need to draw that loop. The other symbol you'll see is battery. We've used that in the class before. Actually, I didn't draw that quite correctly. Uh, that's a, what they call it. That, that would indicate a two cell battery. In fact, just the long line and the short line is really sufficient and you'll see that sometimes. A resistor, uh, which is that little uh, sawtooth wave, a variable resistor, a capacitor showing by two parallel plates. Often you'll also see polarized capacitors which are, can only work in one direction of polarity. In other words, the positive terminal has to be hooked up to the more positive terminal to work properly. 
actually. The reason for that is often because these polarized capacitors are developed from electrolytic cells and they're designed to be polarized only, for example, in one direction. If you polarize them the opposite way, the, uh, what's usually it has formed here is an oxide film on the surface. And if you polarize them the opposite, opposite way, the oxide film is uh, dissolved and they break down and often will heat up and sometimes explode if you hook them in improperly. Um, diodes are used to make rectifying junctions in which current will only flow in one direction. And in this case, the current would flow from uh, this side to the other, from this side to the other. That little line at the end of the triangle so, so, so should suggest to you that the current cannot flow the back way. And so that's, that's one way to tell which way the current's gonna flow is the way through the arrow that the arrow points and it is blocked in the opposite way. I have three things, I, I should have drawn them all in, in a row, but I didn't do that. So here I have circuit common, ground, and earth ground. Every circuit will have a common point on it, and that common point will be the point at which you will make a measurement against or make some statement about. And it's just like a reference electrode in an electrochemical cell. If we want to make a voltage measurement in our electrochemical cell, we have to make it versus a reference point. And we can designate some point in our circuit as the common point or the point at which we'd make measurements against. The circuit common may or may not be at ground potential. And that's the important thing is a common does not mean that it's at ground. It just means that it's the common point at which we're making the measurement. Just like a reference electrode isn't at ground potential in the electrochemical cell. It's just a common point that we're making a measurement against. And ground potential may or may not also be earth ground. And earth ground is a particular type of ground in which you take a eight foot long rod and drive it into the earth and hook a wire up to it, and that's the ground potential. But the earth ground potential may be different from the ground potential in a building by several uh, tens of millivolts or even volts, depending on how big the building is. Uh, if you go to the top of the Empire State Building, it's almost certainly different by several volts uh, from the ground potential at the bottom of the Empire State Building. And that's because there's always some potential difference because of the length of the wires that you've got and, the, and so on. So ground is a local is a local thing. So your lab may all have essentially the same ground potential, but even in some labs you'll have different ground potentials and they often is a cause of instrument misbehaving is to have ground potentials that are not the same from one outlet to the next. And you get what you call ground loops, which we won't talk about right now, but they will cause noise and misbehavior of the instrument typically. Okay, there's a, other things we're gonna talk, we all, we're not gonna talk about transistors, but just to give you an idea what a transistor symbol looks like. This is one particular type of transistors, there are others. That's called a bipolar junction transistor, a BJT. And this one's an N type, for you people that are more interested. It's got the little arrow pointing this way. Uh, if the arrow pointed the other way, it would be called a P type. And that refers to the type of semiconductor that's in tie that's doped in the, in the transistor. And we talked about that last time, N-type semiconductors and P-type semiconductors. So an N-type transistor has a, electrons as a majority carriers and a P-type would have holes as majority carriers. And remember we talked about N-types and P-types. P-types didn't conduct as well. In fact, that's true with transistors. P-type transistors generally don't operate as nicely as N-type connectors because they use holes as majority carriers and they're not as mobile. And so they usually have higher resistances and, and so on. But people, you know, that, that's beside the point. The other two things we're gonna look at are what we call an amplifier. And typically amplifiers are shown as a triangle. And they might draw in there G for gain and they might have a certain gain in there like 10 or 1,000 or a million or 0.1. So any amplifier will have some input and output terminals. And amplifiers, as a rule, have also additional terminals that are not shown, which would refer to the power inputs. Um, amplifiers do not work, do not violate the second law of thermodynamics. They have to have power inputs to have amplified signals out. 
So if they increase the power of the output signal, they have to have a supplemental power source to, to supply that additional power. And the amplification always refers to the input being amplified with respect to the output. So the output, somehow the power is increased at the output compared to the input. So sometimes amplifiers amplify voltage, sometimes amplifiers amplify current only and not voltage, and sometimes they do both. One particular type of amplifier we're gonna talk about is called an operational amplifier, and it's got the symbol of a triangle, but it's got two inputs, a negative input and a positive input, and one output. And again, operational amplifiers work on a separate power supply, and those power supply connections are not shown in this, in most schematics, because they would just clutter it up. Every op, op amp needs the power supply, so they're implied even if they're not explicitly drawn. All right. So let's take a look at uh, how we can analyze some sig simple circuits. In fact, the only complicated analysis that we tool that we need to look at all the circuits that I'm going to show you today is is uh, Ohm's law. And Ohm's law is a relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. And it can be summarized succinctly to say that V is equal to I R. The voltage is developed by a current flowing across the resistance. And of course, you can rearrange that however you like. Ohm's law explicitly only refers to DC signals. In other words, signals that have no frequency, higher frequency components than zero. Now, no signal is truly DC, but most signals are close enough to DC to be suitable for analysis with Ohm's law. Time-dependent signals can be up analyzed with Ohm's law as long as you're very careful at understanding that things are happening at the exact same time scale as other uh, time scales. And as long as you don't have other elements, reactive elements like capacitors and inductors, which do not follow ohmic behavior. Now here's an example of Ohm's law. You might have a voltage source, a battery, and a resistor, and a circuit common point, which could be ground, and it is in the notes. And you'd have, you know, in that case, you have a closed loop, and you have then current flowing through that closed loop. And the voltage, uh, the current that would flow would be set by the voltage applied and the resistor that is flowing across. Now, in most of these kinds, we're assuming the wires have zero resistance, and that's a good assumption uh, for high resistors here. But if R here is one ohm and the current is large, the, the assumption that our wires have zero resistance isn't a very good one. So um, if, as this R becomes smaller and smaller, the assumption of zero resistance wires becomes less and less good. Let's take a look at a more complicated example of Ohm's law. Put in a battery again. Let's put in two resistors in series. And let's ask ourselves the question, what's the voltage across the second resistor? So we'll call this one R1, this one R2. And we can measure the voltage here and measure the voltage across those ter terminals. What is that voltage? What's V2? Well, we have a voltage here. And this particular type of circuit is called a voltage divider for reasons we'll explain in a second. Now, if we have current flowing through this circuit, the current flows in a loop. It always flows to ground or flows from one sort of the circuit to the next. To, uh, so when we say measuring the voltage here, we're, we're measuring in a way that current cannot flow out of those terminals. So current can only flow through R1 and R2 uh, back to ground. And so if current could flow out of those terminals, our analysis would have to be modified. So let's say, so let's say that whatever is measuring V2 there, or whatever way we're detecting V2, does not allow current to flow out of those terminals. Well, in that case, the current that flows has to be equal to Ohm's law. And if we rearrange it, we can see that I would have to be equal to V1, or V over R1 plus R2. And so V2 has to be equal to the voltage drop across R2. And since we know the current that flows across R1 is the same current that flows across R2, and it's the same current that flows across, that flows through R1 and R2, we can say that V2 is equal to I times R2. 
So whatever current flows in that loop is also flowing through R2, develops that voltage V2. By substituting in V2 and this expression we can see in taking these two relationships and rearranging we see that V2 is equal to V times R2 over R1 plus R2. In other words, the voltage at point V2 across V2 is a fraction of the voltage that we've applied originally. And that fraction is set by these, these resistor values. All right, well, we'll see where a voltage divider is used a little later in a potential stat circuit. And we can analyze lots of circuits this way. If you want to analyze uh, uh, resistors in parallel, you have to use the same ideas, but now in parallel the current can flow in two separate legs of the circuit, so you, can, you have to analyze it a little differently. And that's more complicated than I want to talk about today. So let's talk about what really drives a lot of electrochemistry today, and that's what's the use of op amps. Now op amps are really nice devices. They're called really operational amplifiers. People call them op amps for short. And you might see OA is an abbreviation for their, also for their name. They're differential amplifiers, which means they have, they take, amplify the difference between two terminals. Also, the two terminal inputs are high impedance, which means effectively at DC that they have a very high resistance so that current will not flow into those inputs except under very high voltage conditions or very small, either very, you can think of it as either very small amounts of current will flow or current will only flow if you have a very large voltage applied to them. Some op amps have impedances as high as 10 to the 12th ohms. Some do not have so high of input impedances, but all of them have very high imp input impedances, at least 10 to the 9th, 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 9th ohms. 10 to the 9th ohms would be a pretty, pretty poor op amp. But in 10 to the 9th ohms, you can think of if I have one volt applied to those terminals, only one nanoamp will flow into those terminals. So that's still a pretty high level of input impedance. 10 to the 12th, you'd have only one picoamp flowing into those terminals. And that's important that we think about very little current or no current effectively will flow into those terminals. Op amps are amplifiers that are also DC coupled, which means they take and measure signals from DC on up. Many amplifiers, particularly things like in radios and so on, are AC coupled. They only amplify a certain range of frequencies, which does not include DC or the sta uh, stable voltages. Op amps are typically considered to be low frequency devices. They don't amplify signals in the megahertz range typically. Um, so we're talking about low frequency signals, and that's low frequency to the people that are doing things like radar and, and, uh, and radio waves, which use megahertz and gigahertz waves. They also have a very high gain. They're differential amplifiers, so that they amplify the difference between the inputs and outputs, and they use a very, very high gain value, typically 100,000 up to 10 million or more are gain values that you'll see in an op amp. And the final thing is that op amps use negative feedback as a method to stabilize the signal. And we'll explain negative feedback by first explaining positive feedback and why we need to use negative feedback. Well, feedback is simply the use of some fraction of the output and put it back to the input. And I show an example in your notes where you take a, um, an amplifier, and this could be a a speaker, an amplifier at a political rally or something like that, and the speaker has got a microphone that he's holding, and the speaker, the uh, human speaker, is hooked up through an amplifier to run a, a speaker, a magnetic speaker, which puts out sound waves. And sound waves can interact with the microphone, be amplified, and so a fraction of the sound from the speakers, not all of the sound, but a fraction of the sound from the speakers gets hit to the microphone, which is amplified and sent back into the, um, 
uh, sent back into the uh, amplifier. So that makes another round trip. And so once what happens is that the signals get amplified again and again as they go through this process. And you've all heard the results. You get a squeal and a distortion and so on with the microwave. And that's an example of positive feedback. Now what happens is that the amplifier cannot continue to amplify the signal. So the signal builds up to a certain point, at which point the amplifier gets to its physical limits. It can only put out so much current and so much voltage. At that point, the signal then also becomes distorted because you get so what they call harmonics. As, it's, as it gets to the physical limit, you get just harmonics of the signal, and so you get that squeal sound. That's the harmonics that you're hearing being amplified. And if you let that go, it will end up uh, either damaging or blowing out your, your uh, speakers, besides being annoying. So anytime we have positive feedback, not just in the microphone case, but anytime we have positive feedback, you have a situation that is inherently unstable. And you get uh, either distortion, bad distortion, or you have um, um, damage to your system. Positive feedback, though, can be used in some cases effectively to produce oscillations, where you want to make something that oscillates uh, or transitions from one state to the other. And in that case, you use positive feedback to affect that oscillation. But in most cases, you don't use positive feedback. What you often want to use is negative feedback. And negative feedback is a simple concept, but it wasn't really effectively employed until early in the century. The idea with negative feedback is that you take a fraction of the signal out and you invert it before you send it back to the inputs. Let's take our speaker again and suppose we had a situation where we had too much noise coming from some point and you could say, well, let's take a microphone and detect the noise. Coming from this particular external source. You could detect that signal, invert it. We use a negative one gain and send it back through an amplifier to a second speaker that would put out a signal that would be in uh, out of phase with the first signal. So we would put out the exact opposite sound as we detected with the microphone. So that negative feedback would tend to minimize the sound that we see at the microphone. So any signal that we see at the microphone gets canceled out by the other speaker. And as long as there is any signal whatsoever at the microphone, we'll get more signal to be amplified. And eventually, that sound will be canceled out. Now, that doesn't work exactly right with microphones because there's all lots of signal paths and it's complicated. And it's only canceled right where the microphone happens to be. But we can use this idea in electronic circuits more effectively even than in uh, a circuit that would use a microphone and speakers. For example, let's suppose we have our op amp. And now our op amps are designed with very high gain. So let's suppose that we put into our op amp a signal to the negative feedback, or the, what they call the inverting inputs. That's the negative input. And let's suppose we put in a signal that oscillates about 10 microvolts. Now, remember I said the gain at the, of an op amp is very high, so that the output of the op amp, we'd see an inverted version of that signal. But it would be about 10 volts, because our amplification is about a factor of a million. Now that's just not really that useful. Anytime we have that much gain, in fact, we end up running into problems. You can't really use it effectively because these amplifiers are not perfect. They have some additional circuits that would mean that we'd often be very hard to get that 10 volts. In addition, there's temperature effects and, and lots of things. So we wouldn't really expect to get usable amplification in this way, even though it's very high. The output would be equal to uh, Vn times what we call A, and A is the open loop gain. 
it's the normal gain of the amplifier. And as I said, it's like 10 to the sixth, 10 to the fifth uh, million or so. And then notice it's inverted because we're putting it into the, um, and putting it into the negative, in the inverting input. If we put it in the positive input and held the negative input at ground potential or common potential, the output would also still be at 10 volts, but it would not be inverted in phase as you see here. Here it's going down, there it's going up, and that's the inversion in phase that I'm talking about. So let's, so let's take an advantage of this high gain though and use it in a negative feedback way. Well, let's take an example of a, a very simple looking circuit that really is very n interesting when you think about it. This circuit, if you div div built it, where you put the uh, voltage in to the non-inverting input, and notice the terminology we're using, it's non-inverting inputs. In other words, the input is considered to be the opposite of the inverting input. So that's the emphasis is really the inverting input and that should suggest to you that people are always thinking about negative feedback in these devices. So they're thinking about, it's like iced tea in the south. You don't buy sweetened, or you don't buy sweetened tea, you buy unsweetened tea. So you're always thinking about tea that's not sweet. So you can see the emphasis. The emphasis is that the normal state of affairs is that it's sweetened not that it's not sweetened. So in the North, you don't say anything. You just say a tea, and if you want it sweet, you have to say it's sweet tea. So in the North, the emphasis is on not sweetened tea. Same thing with the, and here we have inverting inputs and the non-inverting input. Okay. What's, what's gonna be the output of this? Well, well, I'll tell you what the output is. Um, the V out is just equal to the V in. Okay, doesn't seem like much of an amplifier if we just have the same output as the input, but there's a, there's a, a difference. First of all, the current out may or may not be, but often is, much greater than the current in. Remember I said that the input terminals here are very high impedance, which means that any current that flows would be very limited. But the output terminals of our op amp, which I didn't specifically say, but the output terminals are very low impedance outputs, which means that they can supply large amounts of current if required. So in fact, even though the output voltage is the same as the input voltage, the output current can be many times greater than the input current. And so now you see that we have a power gain. We have a current gain, and that means we have a power gain, and that can constitutes an amplifier. Now, how does this work? Well, notice what's happening. We're taking the signal from the output and we're con directly connecting it back to the input. In order to un understand that, think about what happens if these two inputs are equal to, exactly equal to each other. If the inverting input and the non-inverting input, or the, non -inver uh, the inverting input and non-inverting input are exactly equal to each other, and that would have to be that the case that that would be V in, in that case, then there would be no difference in voltage between those two inputs. And since there's no difference in voltage between those two inputs, the, even though the gain is very high, the output will not change. It'll stay at whatever value it is. Now suppose the V in changes by a tiny amount, even by a microvolt. Well, if it changes by one microvolt, and it was one microvolt difference, and the, the other input, the output now would change by as much as a uh, tenth of a volt because of the high gain. And that would be fed back to the input and to cancel out any change that you might have. But because that happens so quickly, it's almost instantaneous. So you never do see that big change in the signal. It just automatically compensates for any small change. So the negative feedback tracks the output and makes it always the same as the input. And so this makes it very stable. We don't have to worry about the signal changing with temperature and so on that you would have to worry about in the other case. So this has a nice advantage of the outputs equal to the input and the fact that the output current is larger than the input current means it's useful for buffer, buffer situations. 
for example, in many cases, I'm measuring a voltage of the type that the source of the voltage cannot supply a large amount of current. A good example would be a pH amplifier, pH or pH uh, electrode. pH electrodes have high output impedances, typically 10 to the 12th or 10 to the 13th ohms, which means that if we tried to pull any current out of a pH electrode, it would change the voltage and we would not be able to make pH measurements effectively. So pH electrodes are very poor voltage sources, but just because they're poor voltage sources doesn't mean we don't want to use them. So we put in a buffer amplifier like this in between the pH electrode and the recorder, which typically has much lower input impedance, maybe 10 to the sixth ohms, so that any current that might be pulled by the recorder is supplied by the output of the op amp rather than by the uh, pH electrode. So this acts as a buffer and prevents the current from being drawn out of the a voltage source. It has what they call a high Z, where Z is often used as a symbol for impedance. Now impedance is not, exa is not the same as resistance. Resistance is a DC phenomena uh, and a frequency independent phenomena, whereas impedance also includes the effect of other elements such as capacitors and inductors. What it essentially means is high Z means that little current will flow at any particular frequency, not just at DC. So the high Z input, low Z output. In other words, it can supply gain uh, in the form of current. And again, I want to reiterate that op amps in order to work need a supplemental power supply to do this current source. Um, typically for op amps, they're bipolar power supplies. They need both positive and negative voltage sources, and we need enough current at the voltage sources of the power supply to supply at least as much current as the op amp is putting out and then a little bit more. Um, so often for uh, op amps, we're talking about plus or minus 15 volts is typical. and. Uh, but you get plus or minus 24, plus or minus 12, plus or minus 5 sometimes now. And, uh, and so the current that flows out is on the order of plus or minus 10 milliamps would be typical. So they're not, really not a lot of times high power devices. They may be, may be talking about 10 volts to 10 milliamps. So that's only a tenth of a watt. Uh, no, not even a tenth of a watt. Uh, 10 volts, yeah, tenth of a watt of power can be put out by a, a, a typical op amp, and um, which can buy higher powered op amps, but they tend to be very expensive compared to normal op amps, which are a dollar or a few dollars is all. Okay, let's take another look at another example of an uh, amplifier that also uses negative feedback, and this is a very useful amplifier called an inverting amplifier. The idea here is we have an input resistor, input voltage that's supplied across the common. And notice in the previous uh, source, I really didn't suggest, that I suggested that the VN was just applied to a terminal. But remember, we always are applying our inputs with respect to a common point which is often omitted for clarity, but do not be mistaken that there is always a measuring or inputting or outputting voltages with respect to that common point in the circuit. So um, there is always a second terminal when we're applying a voltage, and it may not be apparent, but there's always has, always has to be. We can't just put in a voltage at one terminal without a ground or a common reference. So sometimes that second terminal will be eliminated for clarity, but do not be misled that it's not there. So here we have our amplifier, operational amplifier, and we'll put in another part of the circuit. So we have two resistors, one called RN, one called RF, and the output is on the, on the output of the op amp. And I'll just write down that the V out is equal to the minus V in times RF over RN. In other words, 
there is a negative gain, the output will be the inverted value of the input, hence the name inverting amplifier, and then it will be multiplied by the fraction of RF over RN. And in fact, you can have a, a fraction less than one. You can have 0.1 or whatever, but this would typically be 10 or 100 or something on that range. RF and RN typically are in the kiloohm range too, so don't use one ohm and two ohms. They don't work very well under those conditions because that would require a lot of current flow. So we're talking about kiloohm RFs because we're talking about milliamps and smaller signals typically. All right, so let's think about how this works. Remember that we want the differential amplifier is going to amplify the difference between those two points. So anytime there's any difference between those two points, there is going to be a signal at the output to compensate for it. And so since, let's assume that we're at a balance point where the output is such that the two input terminals are at the same potential. Now if that's the case, since the inverting or the non-inverting terminal is at ground or common potential, the non-inverting input must also be at common potential because if there wasn't, we would not be at a balance point. We would have current and, and uh, a changing voltage at the output because of the way that we said the thing works. So this point here is not actually connected to common, but it is if it is connected to common. So it's called a virtual common or virtual ground. So what can happen? Well, let's think about what happens. Suppose current is flowing in into that virtual ground point, and we'll call that I in. If that's the case, if current is flowing to that common point, remember, it's only virtual, and there's no actually source or sink for that current. It has to go somewhere. In order to cancel that current out, we have to have a matching current of the opposite polarity feeding back to that point. So in order to let current flow into that virtual common point, we have to have current flowing to match of opposite polarity so that those two currents exactly cancel each other out and there's no net buildup of charge which would cause the voltage to be changed. If we didn't have a current flowing to compensate, the charge would build up at that point because current can't flow into the non-inverting or the inverting input. Remember, because that's high impedance. Current has to be flowing there, it has to be canceled by the other one for it to be at balance. So we can easily analyze that. Uh, remember the virtual in input is at, the input's at virtual ground, so that the current in, by the way we've written, it has to be equal to the negative of the feedback current, or I sub F. And by Ohm's law, we know that Vn over Rn has to be equal to minus uh, V out over Rf because that's what, gives, that's what the feedback current is being developed by the output voltage across Rf. And the input current is being developed by Vn across Rn. So those two have to be true. And just by rearranging it, we can see that um, I guess we've, by saying what we know is that V out is equal to RF, that um, V out is equal to minus V in times RF over RN. So we can see we don't have to do any fancy math. We just have to use Ohm's law to analyze the operation of that circuit. As long as we make the, the assumptions that we are, we've made, that there's no current flowing in here and that there's a large gain for any difference between those two terminals. Now the output of the thing has the other pro properties. The output has a low Z output just like the voltage follower. Unlike the voltage follower though, the, there is a, not a high Z input. Because current is flowing into that virtual ground point, the input impedance is not high. It's in fact related to the input resistances and the feedback resistance in a parallel combination. I've shown it there. And uh, that's just a parallel combination. And for DC level signals, it's going to be the parallel combinations of the resistors, which you can derive if you like or look it up, which would be that. So it's not necessarily small or high. It's just inter intermediate.
but it happens to be a very useful amplifier simply by the appropriate choice of those two feedback or two resistors we can amplify things by any any unit value another reason people like to use inverting amplifiers is that it allows us to do what they call summing amplifier topologies or sometimes called adding amplifiers amplifier the idea is very similar to the other one you just develop a circuit like this where you have a feedback resistor and then you have perhaps one or two or three inputs or more as many as you like it doesn't really matter there's no physical limit and you can see now why sometimes we emit the second the, uh, common point of measurement because it becomes a little clumsy uh, to add all those things in. But V out, notice that the current of the, at the outputs has to match all the currents flowing in. And if you do the math, you'll see very quickly uh, that V out, just using again Ohm's law, has to be equal to minus the feedback resistor times the combination, let's call it V1 over R1 plus V2 over R2 plus V3 over R3, and so on. So then if we had more inputs, it would just be additional inputs added on. So you can see why we call it a summing amplifier. We're summing the voltages at each, at each input and summing them to the output. Now the voltages may be different uh, Polarities. In that case, you could think of it, you know, you could subtract a voltage or add a, well, add a voltage depending on the polarity. And you can have a, a net gain on summing, but you could make R1 equal to RF, and you could see then if that was the case, if R1 is equal to RF, then V out would just be the simple sum of the, of the voltage inputs. And it would be inverted, of course. If you want to go back and have it non-inverted, you can just put it through another inverting amplifier with a gain of one, and that would uh, uninverted, if you like. And there, we, there you go. I'm going to skip one of the circuits for just for a second. I'm going to go to the next one. It's a current follower because it's related closely to the th previous two elements. And this is a very popular circuit element used a lot, especially in electrochemistry, because it allows us to directly convert current to voltages with very good accuracy. And the circuit is very simple. We have an op amp and one feedback resistor and output uh, voltage. Okay, so what's happening here? Well, it's exactly the same as our inverting amplifier circuit, except that instead of a voltage input, we have a current input, as we might have in an electrochemical cell. So if this was hooked up to a working electrode, the working electrode would then be held at virtual ground, and uh, just like before, the current would be flowing in, and there would be a compensating current through our, our sub F. And if you do the math, you'll see that V out is equal to, equal to minus I in over RF, or times RF. So we get a negative output voltage that's uh, compared to the polarity of our input current. And so if we want to amplify the signal, we just have to use a higher value of RF and so on. And so this is used a lot. Almost every potentiostat circuit uses a, a, a type of this sort of type of circuit to amplify the current coming into the, the system. Um, current follower amplifiers have the, actually do not have that problem the voltage follower has of uh, um, not having a, a high Z input because in fact for current followers, you don't want, when you're measuring current, you want it to have a very low input impedance and in fact what you have here is a very small input impedance system and that's what you want for current because you want the current to flow into that point not to flow to other points and uh, that allows you a sort of a, a well for the current to flow into. 
So it's a nearly ideal sensor for current. And it's nearly ideal because there's still some problems. If you, for example, if the current coming in is higher than the current capability of the output of the amplifier, for example, if you try to put 100 milliamps into this point, you do need 100 milliamps going through the other, in the other way, no matter what. And your amplifier may not be able to supply 100 milliamps of current. So in that case, your amplifier will not act any longer in the way you'd expect, and you'd have to use a more complicated analysis to figure out what the exact output would be, but rest assured it probably would not be what you'd want. So in that case, you cannot expect that you'd have perfect um, capabilities. Even as you get to the limit, you'll start to see some deviations from ideality. There's another couple problems with the current follower that's really is a function of all op amps, and one would be that you'd have the possibility of having too much output voltage is required to supply the current that you need across the feedback resistor. Um, you may need, for example, 20 volts to get the current to flow that you need across RF to supply it. In that case, you may not have 20 volts to supply. You may only have 15 volts to supply, and so you'd be limited again by the physical capabilities of the amplifier. The fact that you may or may not have enough voltage is what they call a compliance voltage, uh, and all circuits have a compliance voltage. It would suggest how much voltage you can actually put out to supply the, uh, the signal. In this case, this simple op amp is compliance voltage would be whatever the power supply voltage is minus some at some additional amounts. Typically for a plus and minus 15 volts of supplies, you might have a plus and minus 13 volt compliance. And you'll see that a lot. If you look under the specs for many potential stats, you'll see it can supply plus and minus 10 volts or plus or minus 12 volts and plus or minus 10 milliamps. And those are simply because that's what op amps typically can supply and that's what they're using in the circuit. If you want to higher output voltages and higher output currents, you have to add in booster amplifiers that are specifically designed to add on the amount of power that you need to get that thing out. So typically you'd have a, uh, maybe a transistor circuit in here that would be to supply a, a greater amount of current and voltage. We won't get into that. But uh, higher power potentials that certainly have more than op amps in there to do the, to do the job. What are some other problems that you have with uh, these circuits. Well, one of the things is that we've assumed that no current flows in and out of these junctions. And that's definitely not true. All op amps have some amount of current flowing in and out. This leakage current goes by the name of bias current or offset current uh, will affect the amount of compensation that you can actually make. And if it's enough, you can see where a small input current can be imperfectly compensated. Suppose you only have 10 picoamps coming into this point. Now, if your op amp has got a leakage current of a nano amp, it's not going to work. You're going to have so much current flowing in, out, in and out of here that you will be burying any input currents at the output. So your output will have no relationship to the input at that point. It will be related to the leakage current specifications. So you'd need a, an amplifier that would be less leakage current, maybe a tenth of a picoamp. And that would be kind of difficult, actually, to get such an amplifier, all that's possible. Also, you can have offset voltages, and this offset voltages would affect things like voltage followers more directly, but suppose you had an offset voltage of a tenth of a volt at this point. Well, the V out would be whatever the input is plus that offset voltage of a tenth of a volt. Now, if it always was tenth of a volt, no problem. You just compensate for that, but it usually varies with temperature and time, so you don't, that's not great. So you want to use a, you know, and if it's a tenth of a volt may or may not be, a tenth of a volt would be very bad. You, you can't buy an op amp with that bad of a, well, actually you can. They typically would be a, a few millivolts. Uh, so if you want a VN of a few millivolts, you're going to have to worry about whether or not your offset voltage is having that much um, change in the signal. And those would be specifications that you would see uh, in the circuit. Typically, if you're just looking at a uh, potential stat, you wouldn't have to worry about those sorts of things. They're already compensated for by the engineers that made it. But uh, if you're going to build one, you have to worry about what kind of op amp I want to use, what, if it has the right amount of uh, offset current or voltage, and so on. Also, 
the, as I said before, the frequency response of these is limited. At the high frequency, the gain becomes very close to zero. And so once the gain drops below a certain value, your circuit will no longer work in a negative feedback or even a positive feedback mode. It will not have any amplification whatsoever. And then in that case, all kinds of strange things happen. And basically, it means you can't use it above a certain frequency. And that may be uh, megahertz. But in many cases where you have a high gain, the gain is limited, linked to the amount of uh, how high a frequency you can go to. And you may only have a few tens of hertz uh, frequency range, not kilohertz, hertz. So it may only be 20 hertz of, of frequency range if you have a very high gain system. And so that would be situations where you would have to carefully analyze and construct your circuit to improve that. Well, the one other circuit I want to point out before we break, actually a couple more, I think we'll have time to do a couple more before we break. One would be uh, the non-inverting amplifier. And this has a different situation. And you can see that maybe in a second. In this case, the input voltage goes into directly the non-inverting amplifier We have a feedback resistor here as before, but I'm going to call this feedback resistor R2 because it doesn't act like the other feedback resistor did. And we'll call the other feedback resistor R1 and we'll connect that feedback resistor to circuit common. And the input again is at certain circuit common. And let's call this point that's unknown at this point, let's call it V sub X. And here would be V in. He would be V out. Now this has the advantage is that since the voltage is going directly into the non-inverting input, remember that's a high impedance. So it has a high impedance input. So we could use it like we'd use a voltage uh, follower. And we want to buffer a, a high impedance voltage source. And it's also going to have a low impedance output. So that's, a good, that's the good thing about it. Uh, what's the... Um, Output voltage, V out, is equal to V in. Notice that it's not, there's no negative sign there, it's not inverted. And 1 plus R2 over R1. So it's a gain, a situation where we have to use this as a gain of always a positive, uh, a, a number greater than 1. So this is a little bit less flexible than the inverting amplifier in that regard but it has some advantages. Notice how we analyze the circuit. Notice that Vx has to be equal to Vn if we're under feedback control, if we're, at the, if we're balanced at that point, as we said it often is the case. If that's the case, remember that Vx can be analyzed as a voltage divider. Notice this is like a voltage divider circuit. We have a voltage source two resistors and then common, and we're tapping off the voltage right at V sub X. And we already wrote down the result for a voltage divider, and we saw that it was equal to, um, we're using a little different labels here, but the same result. VX is equal to the voltage divider thing, and since VX is equal to VN, that means that VN is equal to R1 over R2 plus R1 times V out. And we can rearrange that to get us our output voltage is what we want. So that would be equal to Vn R2 plus R1 over R1 or more convenient V out is equal to um, Vn and 1 plus R2 over R1. <coughs> so again, very simple analysis, just using Ohm's law. You don't have to do anything fancy to, to make this work out. So almost all these circuits can be analyzed in that simple a way, as long as we assume it's working in a very ideal way. And, and most of the times you can make that assumption and still have a pretty good agreement. Not the case with uh, circuits that result, rely on transistors and so on, where you can't just use Ohm's law to, to even get a simple agreement. Okay, one more, a couple more circuits and we'll, we'll take a break.
and then we'll look at some actual electrochemistry experiments. Differential amplifier, here's another one that we often use. And why do we need it? Well, we need some sort of circuits that will allow us to remove a so-called common mode signal. And this is the case that oftentimes, like I said, remember I said that the signal at, a, uh, at the top of the Empire State Building may be different, but the earth ground may be different than the signal at the bottom of the Empire State Building. Suppose at the top of the Empire State Building we had a, a weather vane and it sends out a signal that's proportional to, the voltage is proportional to the wind speed and it's spinning around. And so we maybe get a 20 millivolt signal. But remember, I said the top of the Empire State Building common may be a few volts different than the bottom of the Empire State Building. And suppose we're running that signal down to the bottom in the basement where our, our uh, control shack is or whatever. Well, if we have uh, this common signal of t two volts and we try to amplify it versus our common at the basement, maybe it's easier to draw this, we have our, our weather vane up top, let's call it, let's just, let's just say it's rotating and we have a little box and that box is local, is measuring the voltage with respect to the local common point and that's 20 millivolts and we're sending it down here to the bottom and we're using it to amplifying it versus the um, the local pot potential, which may be um, at ground potential or earth potential, there may be a difference here of two or three volts. Let's just say it's two volts. Well, we've got 20 millivolts is really what we want to measure, but we've got a, now that two volts on top of that 20 millivolts. And that won't be the same all the time. It'll vary from day to day. And, year to year. So what we want to do is have some way of removing that common mode signal, so-called common mode signal, the difference between those two reference points, and that's where a differential amplifier comes in. So common mode signal may be things like a, a ground potential difference or a common potential differences, or maybe things like you might have a, a noise that's due to the 60 cycle noise, the power supply noise can get coupled onto both wires as it goes down the, the line, and that can add in a common 60 cycle noise which will have some problems with you later. And there's a lot of things where you'd use it for. I'm just going to give you one example. Suppose we have our circuit like so. We have input V1, input resistor R1, our amplifier is so, feedback resistor here R2, I've drawn this a little differently than in the notes, but you can see that it's exactly the same if you, if you look at it carefully. Okay. Differential amplifier, what's the output voltage? Well, we'll just write it out as before. V out is equal to the relative ratio of R2 over R1 and then a the difference between V2 and V1. So this kind of circuit could be used to cancel out any differences in the common mode. So in this case, V1 would be our common mode signal that we would try to, to eliminate. I'm not going to do the analysis here because I think if uh, what I might want to suggest is if you really want to test yourself, you can run through and you can use Ohm's law just as we did before and understanding that those two points have to be always be at the same potential and try to calculate why that is. And it becomes more complicated and then, and then uh, condenses into that simpler form. Now sometimes you'll make R1 and R2 the same and then in that case output voltage would just be equal to V2 minus V1 and uh, we just give a straight difference. The measure of how good this would be is how effectively it eliminates that common mode signal. And that has to do with how well those resistors are matched. If they're not exactly the same, which is often a problem, then we'll only be able to cancel out a small fraction or a fraction of the difference. So maybe we can cancel out 99.9% .9 of that two volts. Well, that's still not good enough. We want to cancel out a factor of 10 to the fourth 
of that two volts at least to get down to our 20 millivolts and, uh, and better. So that's why we need a good discrimination between that between those two points and a good subtraction. Not just a little bit of a subtraction, a really good subtraction. Okay, one more thing. And there's actually lots of examples of uh, op amp circuits. I'm just giving you a very small example, but these are the common ones you'll see in all the textbooks. Um, but here's another one where you might be interested in using it in an electrochemical sense. This would be an example of an integrator. Not a very good integrator, but it's a, a first, first stab at having an integrator. Here we have, instead of a resistor in the feedback loop, a capacitor in the feedback loop. Now what's going to happen here? Well, in the same sense as before, those two inputs have to be maintained at an equivalence value, equal value. So let's assume that the output, the two inputs are equal to the same p potential. In this case, that's going to be the common potential for the non-inverting input. So this is going to be, again, virtual ground. Current will flow into virtual ground as before from the input. So current will have to flow there. To compensate, current has to flow out of our capacitor. And current can't flow through the capacitor, but it can flow from a capacitor from one of the plates. And likewise, current can flow to the other side of the capacitor. What will happen when we draw current out of the capacitor is that its voltage will rise or fall uh, because the charge on those plates will be varied. As the charge on the plates varies, the voltage will vary. And the amount of charge that we get out of there will be reflected as how much uh, charge actually flows in. So the more current that flows into that point, the more charge will flow out. And so the output voltage is really going to be a count of the amount of charge that has flown out or has flown out of the out of that uh, capacitor. And so we can say that the change in the input voltage over the resistor is equal to the minus the capacitor value times the change in the voltage with time. And that means that our output voltage is going to be equal to one, minus 1 over Rnc times the integral of the input voltage with time plus a constant. And so this circuit allows you to integrate the amount of current. All the current that flows in has to be matched by current flowing out of the capacitor, which then changes its voltage to compensate for that. Um, of course, there's some problems. One is that in order to get the voltage to come out of the capacitor to be a certain value, the voltage has to continue to rise at the output. So as long as current's flowing in at the input, we're going to have voltage will be continue to rise all the time. So a constant current in will eventually cause the output voltage to be too large, to be larger than can physically be supplied by the device. And that means that at that point, our integrator will no longer work properly. Uh, it'll just peg out at a voltage, and then it'll stop integrating. So periodically, you're going to need to reset your integrator so that your um, voltage will get back to zero. You have to set your charge counting anew at some point. And so you could uh, add a switch on there across the feedback loop to short out the capacitor, let the current then equalize. At that point, you'd have uh, the equivalent of an inverting amplifier with very low gain, zero gain in that case, uh, and so on. Also, there's because of the bias currents that flow in and out of the points, and because of that integrator is going to be very sensitive to any amount of current, just letting it sit without having any signal at all on it will cause the capacitor to charge up because of the bias currents. And so it eventually will just, very quickly in fact, probably will hit, the, uh, hit a limit. Uh, but under the right conditions, if you design it correctly to periodically zero the charge to minimize the bias currents, to minimize the temperature effects and things like that, you can have a very good integrator uh, and people use, use these sorts of circuits a lot. All right. Well, now I think we've got enough so that we can have maybe a reasonable shot at understanding
what our electrochemical circuits are doing when we're actually doing the experiments. So let's stop here and we'll start that in the next, the next uh, section.